I want to talk to you today about finding your voice and using it to make a difference. I think uh, when I started writing, finding your voice or what my voice was was very elusive and I still feel like it's a process all through your life. And I think products sometimes have voices like Apple and finding your voice might be your mission. When I was trying to figure out why I wanted to give this talk, um, I found this great John Grisham quote and then I thought, should I need a quote by someone else to start a finding your voice talk? <laughs> but. My voice, I think, is honest, vulnerable, self-deprecating, and so I can admit that I could not top this, this quote. He said, in life, finding a voice is speaking and living the truth. Each of you is an original. Each of you has a distinctive voice. When you find it, your story will be told. You will be heard. Um, and I think that's true. That's all I've ever read of John Grisham's, but I'm going to read more. <laughs> I can admit that. So I have a vulnerable, self-deprecating voice. Um, anyway, I think uh, the first question about uh, finding your voice is, where are you from and how does it inform who you are? Now, I'm from Oklahoma. I, don't, I didn't know any writers. I didn't know anyone in the business. The license plate when I was growing up was, Oklahoma is OK, which I always <laughs> thought was funny, because it was kind of like, we're not over-promising. <laughs> We're, you know, it's not great, but, and um, that was kind of my upbringing. My dad raised me to believe you need a career to fall back on. Nobody was expecting anything very great. And um, I think that's kind of a good way to grow up, actually. And then the way we raise our kids now, where we're expecting them all to become something wonderful. So I'm raising an average child. Hopefully, she'll surprise me. <laughs> um, in, uh, in, in Oklahoma, I had a teacher in the fourth grade, Virginia Davis, who told me that I was a writer. And we were doing poetry, and she just thought my writing was good, and she said I was a writer. She might have said this to a lot of other students, but I took her at her word. And I loved this identity of being a writer. And I would go on family vacations and write poetry. And recently, this teacher, Virginia Davis, died, and her daughter sent me over the years, we'd corresponded. She'd saved all my letters. She'd saved my poems from fourth grade. And there was one in particular that stood out to me. It was a line in a poem about ponds from fourth grade. And it was, the sun is shining on it all until the sign of night doth fall. Now, clearly, that was not my voice. I don't know who I was imitating <laughs> or what I thought a poet was supposed to be or what language a poet had to use. But I think this is something to remember because I still see it when people write business memos or technical brochures or um, closing arguments and a legal argument. There's sometimes the language you feel like you're supposed to be using or words or the size of words you're supposed to be using. And um, it can stop you from finding your voice. So a question to ask is how can you make a living doing what you love? I went to Northwestern University. I was looking, uh, oh, that's good, uh, to the Medill School of Journalism. I found this uh, slide they have on their sign department of, I think this was just faked up, but department of uh, fake news, which is appropriate now. But at Northwestern, it was anything but fake news. It was hard news, and you were supposed to keep yourself out of it. No first person in your pieces. No, it was supposed to be very objective reporting. And, um, and it was really an exercise in trying to figure out how to Keep your voice out of your pieces. And needless to say, I wasn't very good. I wasn't a very good student. The good students got sent to like Cocoa Beach, Florida for this internship where they could watch um, NASA activities. And I got sent to Binghamton, New York. And um, that was that was it was like Siberia basically. And um, there was one, there were two things that happened there that were, I will always remember. And one was that one night, this was years ago, so saving wasn't as easy. We were all working on our stories. There was a blackout, and we lost almost everything right before deadline, and we had to recreate the paper. And um, I, they've said since it was one of the best papers they did because we were all just remembering what was important, what we wanted to communicate, what we remembered about all our pile of notes that was important to share. And I sometimes think of that when I'm stuck writing just throw it all away, stop looking through the reams of paper. This is happening to me right now because I'm working on a script and there's reams and reams of notes and I just have to put it away and write what I know I want to express. Um, so they also sent me on an uh, on a adventure, on a story assignment. They said, find the longest school bus route in the area. So I found one that was an hour and a half and um, take it in the morning and in the afternoon and write a story about it. 
And because they said take it in the afternoon, I thought now they're just trying to get rid of me because really what else is going to happen that I couldn't <laughs> record in the morning. But it turned out to be this story that was a big Sunday feature because there was so much going on on this bus. There was a row that the young kids should not go beyond. There was this history of like perfume fights on the bus. There was kind of a bully. There was a kid who had a note the size of his torso attached to him, so clearly he lost many notes before. There was a guy, uh, one kid with like a bowl of flowers for his teacher because he had knocked over the incubator that had these chicks in it. And the janitor was going to sell these chicks at the fair and she called him a murderer. So um, there were just a zillion mini dramas on this bus and I wrote about it and it was so fun and it was my first taste of writing a feature. Being able, it wasn't first person but I was still able to find the story in this world of what was happening and it gave me a little taste of what my voice might be. So I moved to New York, I got a job in advertising. I was interviewing for some newspapers and I was finding myself apologizing for not having done more, done better in my journalism classes, done, worked on the school newspaper at Northwestern, and I came up with this corollary that uh, if you're apologizing in a job interview, you may be, well first you may just be a woman, but second, <laughs> you may be in the wrong job interview. And to me, I was in the wrong job interview, so I got a job in advertising, it was in New York City, and while I was in New York, there were suddenly voices speaking to me that were first person, comic, conversational voices. And uh, now my favorites are like David Sedaris, but at the time there was one magazine Meryl Marco used to write for. She created Stupid Pet Tricks, but she wrote this first person essays. It was a back page of a magazine. It was always a different writer. It was very conversational, this magazine called New York Woman. And um, I wrote one. I, I knew from journalism school how to just submit to an editor, but I wrote this piece. I submitted it blind. My boyfriend at the time said, you're just a girl from Oklahoma. Don't be worried if they don't publish it because it was all about New York, what New York is, my point of view. And um, so I'm not, no longer with that boyfriend, but this piece <laughs> got published, um, to, which is using your voice is like sending up a flare. This piece started everything for me, and it was just observations. One of my favorites is um, uh, on opening night, New York is on opening night when a woman races across the room to ask whose dress you're wearing. She is not asking from whom it was borrowed, but for the name of the designer. Because I said <laughs> my friend Lauren's and I, she was confused. <laughs> Um, or naming your mouse after someone you despise so you can eventually kill it. It was all these little observations, and it kind of sent out this flare of my voice, because it was first person. I used, the, actually I didn't use the word I, I used you, but it was my voice, my sense of humor. And um, a magazine editor saw it and told me to think about writing more magazine essays. And then also a producer from television saw it and said I should think about sitcom writing. So it kind of started these two divergent pieces of my career, which came together later. But um, I met with this magazine editor. It was a woman from GQ, and they had a column called All About Adam. And it was um, a woman's perspective on men. And she was asking me what I might have to say or write. And something had happened that I thought was maybe the beginning of a piece I might want to write. Oh, oops. Oh, they said I might not need to. There we go. OK, so a doorman informed me that my date was not coming down ever. <laughs> this. For anyone who watched Sex in the City may remember Miranda saying this, because much later I used it in the show, but I was, it was Valentine's Day, which was too sad even to ever write anywhere except to say it here. It was Valentine's Day, I was stood up, and my, I thought he was my boyfriend, lived close by in a ho I mean, in an apartment doorman building, and so I went over to ask if what was happening, and the doorman called up, and then while I was standing there, he had to tell me he's not coming down, and it was like getting broken up with by the doorman, through the doorman. <laughs> So I was broken up with by a doorman. So I wanted to write a piece about why do men not break up well? Why do they just disappear like the Lone Ranger? And I had all this sort of stories from friends of not getting closure after a relationship. And as an aside, that guy, he had kind of this male pattern baldness. I still, to this day, when I see that hair, I, I go, because I never talked to him after that, so I still feel like I need to know what happened. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wrote this piece for All About Adam, and it was all about why men don't break up well. And um, the, eventually that column got phased out before the piece got published. And so I got a kill fee, and I ended up sending it to some friends, and it made its way to Glamour. And they said, can you rewrite it for women? 
And it was like the heavens opened up because I then wasn't saying, why do men do this to men? I was talking to women saying, why does this happen? And commiserating and not kind of coming up with the answer, but just sharing the pain, which turns out to be my, my favorite voice, really my voice. Um, and so a big part of this is who is your audience? Now I'm at, I find, uh, even though I knew my audience, sometimes even preparing this speech, I'm thinking, who am I talking to? Who are these people? And I got very intimidated thinking of all the tech and how smart and a big audience, even if it's you know all women who I think I know how to talk to, it's a little confusing to figure out how to write for that. So I would imagine a smart, funny friend who gets you. I had a friend, Marie, and many of my first columns I wrote for magazine were writing to Marie. And even television, I would think, what would I put in an email to her? What would I say to her on the phone? Because she gets me, she likes me, she thinks I'm funny, I'm not trying to prove myself to her, or prove how smart I am. So I recommend that as a tactic for whenever you're kind of overwhelmed with who you're speaking to. Just imagine someone who gets you, likes you, and is funny, hopefully. Um, write what you're wrestling with. McKee, who taught a class in screenwriting that has been much talked about and lampooned, he did say, um, to write about a question you have. And in Sex and the City, Carrie always had a question she was wrestling with, and we almost always got assigned scripts based on who was most comfortable with that topic. <laughs> and then we would have to figure out how to talk about it in a way and wrestle with these questions, and it ended up being these really good scripts. And I still, sometimes in really dark times, I will keep a journal that's not for publication, that's just for me, because two days later, after whatever trauma, breakup, whatever, you've kind of started to put some order to it or make some sense of it. But right in the moment, there's never anything like that sort of wrestling with it then, just to look back and remember what you were feeling. So write about it while you're in it, and then write on the side, which was interesting because our, our artists who I loved spoke about uh, doing a project on the side. I've always kind of believed if you're not 100% creatively fulfilled, just on the side of what you're doing, do what you love and kind of, it can be just for yourself because it's satisfying, it can be so you have the goods when the opportunity comes along, um, but it's important I think to still be doing what you would want to do for the audience you want to talk to on the side, whenever you can. Um, and save the book draft, even if there's no book. This was a coping strategy I came up with when I was writing for Glamour because they would always say, what's the, takeaway, what do you want women to know? What are you trying to teach them? And I was like, if I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't still be writing a dating column on Saturday night. I don't have the answers, I have the questions. So I would write my draft and then I would save what I called the book draft, which would be the, their draft. And I still do that sometimes and I think in any job, my husband's a criminal defense attorney, sometimes he'll write a very long piece about systemic problem. He's discussing and then for publication it has to be cut down but you never know when for a talk or for a book or for something else you might want your original piece. Um, now as a television writer you can tell your stories through the lens of the show and in the voices of the characters. When I, my first like seven years in television I was working on kind of shitty shows that only my parents would watch and nobody was trying to make a shitty show but it just it, it happened sometimes. <laughs> So uh, eventually, I got on Everybody Loves Raymond, and it was a room where we brought in our own stories. And over hiatus, I had had a, something happen in my family. My dad is a terrible driver. And he, my sister and I have always known that we will probably die in his car, you know, since when we were young. But then when she had kids, we start talking about, well, they shouldn't have to die in his car. So she had to have the talk with my dad, and we strategized how to have the talk that he would no longer be allowed to drive the kids. And I brought this into the Raymond Writers' Room, and it became this story, Driving Frank, which was about that discussion that you have to have with your parent and how it brings up these issues of mortality. So on a television show, well, first of all, in thinking of how to write Ray Romano or for, um, for these different characters, you can sort of hear their voice and their voice is a combination of their experiences and their point of view and their intonation and their sense of humor. And writing voices for other people helped me clarify my own, I think. But it also was fun to see how stories that you had in real life could be filtered through and then get a wider audience, the way the writer's room would add to it and make it bigger and better, deeper. Um, so that was Raymond. And while I was there, I had been writing with a writing partner who, uh, for seven years, when I met her, she was going through a hard divorce, and seven years later, she was still going through a hard divorce. <laughs> so every day was like, 
and now we have to write comedy, which is very heavy. And then, so anyway, we were a great team in the beginning, but I was ready to write on my own. And while we were on Raymond, we split up and we were each gonna write our own Raymond. So we had to publish piece. And then I wanted to write something that would represent me. And all these shows I had been on were mostly family shows or I was on Coach, which is very much about sports and men. And I had never really been on a show like Sex and the City, which is the show that I saw and thought, I'll write a spec. And eventually I decided instead to, a spec is like a script that won't be produced and you can write it as a sample. But uh, I had a friend working on it who said, why don't you come in and pitch? So Phil Rosenthal, who was running Raymond, let me go in and pitch. And it was kind of like I was having an affair because I was on this family show, but I was having sex on the side. <laughs> so I wanted to say that the closer to your heart a job is, the more you will have to contribute. What I found when I was pitching this episode, for one thing, all the, uh, all the essays I'd written over the years, which was maybe just one a year, which were these dating essays, were suddenly great samples for this show. And I hadn't really been able to use them when I was writing with a partner, but I could use them now. But also, uh, everything in my life seemed to add up to something that could be part of this show. And for example, the first episode I wrote, at the time, I was, um, I was dating a guy, and the biggest thing that had happened was he had given me the pink toothbrush head, the electric toothbrush, which there's only one. So it was kind of a big deal, but it wasn't a really big deal. <laughs> and, uh, and I bought a house, and everyone said, as soon as you buy a house, someone will propose. And then I had some friends house sitting, and they got engaged in my house, which is, <laughs> which is why Miranda said in the episode, I thought it would be to me. So they did uh, ask me if I would write a poem for their wedding, and I read, wrote this poem for them, and I read it at their wedding. So that's me reading this poem at their wedding. Um, and then I sort of broke down in the middle of it because I just realized that I had a toothbrush head and they had a marriage. And um, so then I had to play it off like I was just overcome with emotion. And, um, <laughs> which is what Carrie did. So, um, so this episode is an example and just the whole time I was on that show it just felt like firing on all cylinders because the show was so close to my voice and my audience and my heart. And when you're in that position, when you find your voice, it carries. Um, I did end up writing a book out of all those book, dra book drafts called The Between Boyfriends Book, a collection of cautiously hopeful essays. And, um, and it got translated into nine languages. And the show won a lot of awards and kind of changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, but I was still me, as an example. Uh, the day after we won the Golden Globe, I was at an ATM machine and a security guard came up to me and said, were you on TV last night? And I said, yes. And he said, did they find your baby? <laughs> Ser I'm serious. And then I kept replaying how eagerly I said, yes. Like, so glad I didn't say <laughs> too late. And it was so ridiculous, because of course he didn't see me on TV. Like, I was, you can barely see me in this photo. I was on stage. I didn't give the speech. I walked, but anyway. So <laughs> these humiliating things continue to happen to me. Um, and, uh, this, and by way of telling you how many dating stories I had, someone gave me a past lives experience phone call, which I remember thinking, it's a phone call. How's she going to, like as if I, if I was in person, it would be completely valid, but over the phone, <laughs> how will she know what I was? But anyway, she told me I hadn't had a good relationship since ancient Greece, <laughs> which I was like, I know I was in a rut. But so, <laughs> so I had so many dating stories and so much fun on Sex and the City. And then I got married and my career was over. <laughs> I really did worry about that because I had really developed a voice about dating. I had a dating column and glamour. I was such an, I was kind of an expert for better or worse. And I knew my audience and suddenly I thought, who cares? Once you're married, who cares? And I didn't really have a template for how married people talk about the same sorts of things. I think there's kind of a closing of ranks that happens when people get married because um, they're respectful of their partner. But I was not. So <laughs> uh, I wrote a book. And um, it was called The Longest Date, Life as a Wife. I didn't start out out of the gate as soon as I got married knowing what my voice was and what I had to say on the subject. But over the years, basically, we got married. and. Um, I always, I was saying I wish we had five years just to be a couple, and then it took us five years to have a baby. We eventually adopted, but that journey of, um, 
of basically trying of infertility became a big part of the book, write about it when you're in it. And I was writing this book while we were still in it and I wanted to write something for women, but I wanted to write in the same voice I'd written about dating, about marriage. And it was a good challenge and a good reminder that no matter what happens, like now as a mother, that I can still sort of find my new voice, find my audience, it's evolving. So finally, I wanna leave you with which causes are speaking to you. I think once, I think this has come up here a lot, but right now there's this Facebook echo chamber, there's dog whistle politics. It feels like we're talking to each other, but you feel a little bit overwhelmed of what, how can I make a difference? How do I possibly affect systemic racism? After I read Between the World and Me, what can I do? <laughs> and I, um, I thought something that we used to do in a writer's room was a good tip. And basically, in a writer's room, you sometimes say, this is the road, or this is a bad idea, or this is the bad version, or this is the on the nose version. But that's how the discussion gets going, and that's how we come up with something kind of brilliant, or at least funny, or human. And I think it's important to remember that we all, when we send our authentic voice out and our authentic truth, even if you don't have the answer, help contribute to that discussion. And one small example of this was, after the Las Vegas shooting, there was, I don't know if you guys knew or remember, there was a lead guitarist for the band, the Josh Abbott band, Caleb Keeter. I had never heard of him before this, or the band, but he was there and he wrote about how I've been a proponent of the Second Amendment my entire life until the events of last night. And it was this poignant piece he put on Twitter. I wouldn't have been aware of him, but his unique voice cut through all that clutter and made me hopeful at a time that it seemed really hard to be hopeful that maybe we would come together in the middle. And he also put out this message to his audience, which probably was not the, uh, you know, typically the most receptive to gun control. And uh, it just made such a difference that he put it out in his voice for his audience and to reach a larger audience. So in conclusion, I hope you'll all do what I hope I've done here, which is find your voice and inspire others to make a difference. Thank you.